好的，然后下一个演讲是来自于吉拉德，然后吉拉德是北大社区在呃北京的一个一个成员，然后他将给我们带来就是用 Docker 进行呃持续进程。So the next topic is from Giraffe from uh from Fedora user group of Beijing, and he, he is going to introduce Docker and the continuous deployment and the delivery for us. So let's welcome Gerard. So both software and talking about the people. So having this event, it's all due to people that helped and stuff, and I helped them to assist them to get this done. Um, but I did it mostly for the Fedora project. I've been on FEMSCO, the Fedora Investor Steering Committee. That means that uh, I was in charge of getting the budget to, uh, so stuff aligned and handed over to people that needed it. And I've worked for a long time at the Ministry of Defense in the Netherlands. That was my most interesting job. I did that for two years. And I actually sat in a tank with our software. <laughs> it's awesome. But yeah, unfortunately, that's just a period of my life. Now I'm back here in China. But I'm here as an IT consultant for uh, ThoughtWorks. So our job is to do software delivery for companies. Proprietary software, mostly. But we also do pro bono work as open medical record system. So we hope that our systems get used, open source systems in that case, for uh, helping with medical documentation. Um, but I work currently on a project. It's a lot of, the, is done as a web application. And we know software development off for the web used to be easy, but not anymore. So I'll talk about that. So, and at the end, I will have some books so, um, to hand out. The anthology book about how we do software development, some bad, of oh, good practices and some bad things you shouldn't be doing. So we'll talk about that. So if you follow my slides, I will probably ask a question. If you can answer it, you get the book. <laughs> yeah? And besides that, I love teaching. Yeah? I like talking and teaching. It's not the same, comes close, but that's what I do. So, first of all, who knows what actually CD stands for. And now look at that one, not the blue one, not, not, not this. Because that's what I will call it. Huh? Who knows what CD stands for? Continuous delivery. Yeah, exactly. Continuous delivery or continuous deployment. They sound similar, but they're actually not the same. And it's a thing that has been talked about a lot. I will try to talk about it not as continuous delivery or deployment, I will call it more consistent development and consistent deployment, because I will be using Docker. I will leave a part out, and I will tell you at the end what, because we're still working on that. So, uh, but in 2000, tell me, what was the most important language in 2000 to do web development? Perl? No, I didn't know Java. No. PHP? PHP, exactly! <laughs> Yay! <laughs> and why? <laughs> PHP Nuke, WordPress, and Drupal were all launched in that time period. It was the most popular language 
I wouldn't say the best, but it did the job. Huh? You did probably in other language, you maybe used some JavaScript in the front end, but we called it DHTML, dynamic HTML. Right. But it wasn't that much, it wasn't very advanced. So, 2005. What is the most popular language on the internet? Ruby. Rails. No, it's not decided. We have Ruby on Rails. It was just released, 2005. We had Django, just released. But if you went to a hoster and you wanted to have any hosting, no. what would no. they offer you? No Django, no Python runtime. Certainly Rails? No. <laughs> they were offering you PHP. And it's <laughs> So this is a problem, and it's still the problem. If you look cheap hosting, you will get PHP. <laughs> yeah. So, when I hear this kind of term, people talk about full stack engineering. We want full stack engineers. <laughs> Great. Yes, I totally believe that. I want full stack engineers. But often I call it more, it's haystack engineering. <laughs> because <laughs> it's hard to find a person that knows everything and it's sometimes even hard because even if you have the stack defined, there are many different versions of the same tool. PHP 5.5 or PHP 5.4. My hoster doesn't offer it. Maybe it's Python 3.3 and then, oh no, 2.7. It's, it's a hell. So, when they talk about this term, they say it very often, DevOps. Developers and operations, they work together and we're going to make that problem go away magically. Well, it solves a lot. Sure, I do agree with that. Having these people work together solves a lot. But I hope we don't have to use ops. It's all about developers, I hope. But that's maybe for the future. But the most important word that I believe in is platform as a service then. Mm -hmm. Probably you understand why. Because then it doesn't really matter. They offer you a yeah. platform as a service. Well, I have some PHP code. Maybe I have some Python <coughs> code. I don't care. As long as I can host it there. So this is kind of what I'm going towards. Yeah? So I will call that first consistent development. And what is consistent development? One of the first practices you will be doing? Continuous integration. Who knows what it is? Raise your hand development. if you know it. Yes. Develop and, and unit testing. Uh, regression testing and deployment. Well, deployment not. That's a different story. Okay. But you get a book already. <laughs> <laughs> Source code management is the most important thing. Why? You should have a shared repository. Yeah. All your code should be shared among all the developers. Yeah? But besides that, you have to automate the build. On your system, on your machine, you don't need to type commands. Well, maybe one command. Make, exactly, good example. You get a book. Yeah, <laughs> yeah so that's, I have three more. <laughs> well, but you have, you have a lot of options, but automating the build, make is a good example, because in a make you have your recipe. How should it be done? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah? In, in the other worlds, you might have a rake script. Huh? You do it with yeah. Ruby, or you do it pack in JSON. You describe first which operation should be called. That's very important. But you're not building on your machine. You're going to push that to the archive. And you build on an integration machine. Mm -hmm. Because I've heard so often, but it builds on my machine. <laughs> I don't care. <laughs> it doesn't build there, and it doesn't build there. Oh, 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 it doesn't build, I don't know. But it works on my machine. <laughs> yeah, I have a problem, because that means that on his system, he might have installed something you don't have. And it should yeah. be shared. Yeah, but after you've done that, oh sure, please come in. So after that, you should be doing testing, and we call it preferably self-testing. <coughs> Scripts should be triggered automatically. Yeah. They should do the whole flow. Whatever you can, you should be automating. After that, your testing has deliverables, a test report. These filled and these worked. Huh? This is all important information, but besides that, the executable itself. You have delivered something. It might not be perfect, but at least we know what failed. And these yeah. deliverables should be accessible. Because you don't want it. Oh, that build succeeded. Oh, let's go to my machine. I'll build it. Yeah. And he builds it on his machine and there's an executable. No, wrong. 
they should be shared. Yeah. And then, you actually should be testing in a clone of production. You don't test in an, just an environment that's perfect for your idea. No, what the customer may be using or what a user may be using. Yeah? And then, of course, we still say keep the build fast. It's one of the things why, if you're checking your code, and you have to wait one hour the whole build press, uh, process to do these things, and then you get a report, and all these tests take half an hour. You're checking. You're going to stop. No, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to check in. Wait, I still have more work to do. Oh, I still have more work to do. Because if I send, it takes me one hour and a half to get a report. So you want to keep the build as fast as possible. Easy turnaround. But that means also you can make, eventually, your commit smaller. So in every change you do, you get more instant feedback. So this is what we call CI. So how are we going to do that? Well, he already said it. First of all, I won't want to use Docker, but he said it already. You have to automate your build. <coughs> I will be using Docker and LXC and C groups. Hey, why was the slide messed up? <gasps> My slide is messed up. Why is that? <laughs> I have some information. Yeah, I don't use fragments. I have not been able to use fragments here. Here, yeah, there's my text. There's my text. Hope you don't miss a comma or something. Yeah, I might have missed a comma. <laughs> I have used build scripts. Oh, I know why. Ah, I see what I did. So, how? I should have done this. I should have done arrow down. That's <laughs> why. <laughs> not sideways, down. <laughs> okay, build scripts. That's what I wanted to say. First, you do build scripts. Uh, to automate your build. Yeah? You don't want this recipe that somebody says, oh, now it was and, and then some parameter. Oh, and now it was, what was it again? And and then environment? No. What you can, you have to write down in a script. But you want to run it on a build server, because that's the integration machine. Not your local machine, a separate machine. Why? Because you want to improve your consistency every time you want the same kind of result. It's important because that's what we're calling quality. So one of these examples out there, if you have an open source project or you do some software development for an enterprise, they might have paid for that. Travis. Who knows Travis? Yeah. For those who don't, I'll quickly go there in my browser. Uh, so here. Oh man, that's small for me. <laughs> no white screen. Okay, so this is Travis. So if you would have an open source project, you have a GitHub repo, you add a file, and automatically every commit you do, you do will end up here in a continuous integration environment. So I have some projects. It's quite busy website, so searching. <laughs> I'll tell you, I have several projects and they all build. Phew, <laughs> <laughs> safe from that one. So, but this is actually what I said. This is the, the, the interface. So one of the projects, Docker itself, every commit they do to the repo will be built. And if they want, they can have tests at the end that show the results. But that's not all. There are more projects that do this. Jenkins is one. Jenkins looks like this, very common overview. Huh? Green means succeeded, red means it failed. Huh? Yellow, it's inbuilt, we don't know yet. And there's one that my company made, uh, Cruise Control was the first name. Uh, CruiseControl.net for Microsoft products specifically. Uh, they recalled it Go, now Go CD, and it's been recently open source. So all of this is completely on the internet. This is almost, I would say, 10 years of internal development that we now give away. So this is what it looks like. Initially, you have an overview of your different projects. But you notice here, we have build stages, different things. And each stage, immediately, or you can have a different assignment, different tasks. So one is building. Build when good. Second one would have been probably testing. So you would know, OK, the software builds perfectly, but it fills in actual running any test. And why is this important? It's because when you have a lot of dependencies between projects, you want to know which component filled and did what. Because when eventually you might have an executable that end up at the end, 
because you have certain tests that did pass, you want to be following which version caused that, which code got pushed in, and this helps you a lot with that. When something fails, you actually will not have the final delivery. That's that's thing. That is something I'll talk about later. But that's very important. So you run tests, as you said already. We have unit tests and behavioral tests. Anybody know what that is? No. Okay. Very simple. I have a project here, and I'll be showing. Maybe I'll do first. I'll install the build server. So. I think you can see that, yeah. Uh, maybe I have it here, not so sure. So this is my build server. This one is built on top of Docker. So you need to have Docker installed on your machine, but you need to have this executable called drone. D. And there it is. And now I can go to the website, which is a local host page, so here. Local host 8080. I can log in. I still hope I remember that. Yes, I did. And there's my build <laughs> server. Hey, that's easy deployment. Before, when you had to start install a build server, it took you a lot of effort. You needed to have the Java environment, maybe, or other languages. It took you a lot of configuration files. Now it's just one single executable. Yeah? <laughs> Great! So, what I have here, I have defined one repo, and you see here nothing happened. It's because I need to push something to that repo. But I'll be showing not this version, I'll show one that's actually connected to the internet, because it's more interesting. So, so I will have a, a project here. Um, on my command line, I go to demo repo. I will remove something very quickly, because that's problems uh, I'm not going to deploy so that's the thing. Get that. Yeah. Get. Get. Demo time. Okay, so this is a repo that I have. I'll first open a page where you can see this one. That's this repo. This is one of my projects that I have. This is on drone.io. This is the hosted version. So this company or this group of people, they have a hosted version. But I have one also on my own server, so you can see um, it's open source and they actually distribute it. There, it's the same one on my server. The spots now, that's mine. So, and last one I, I showed you, they're failing. It's because I did some, some testing recently and it didn't go well. So. But I'll now have a, a file that if I do my git push to my origin master, it's going to do some magic. So I hope Bitbucket works. Yeah, Bitbucket works. We're in China, so that's not always the case. <laughs> <laughs> you need a VPN for that. But GitHub, good. GitHub, good. Yeah. Oh, see here, demo time. See, there are one. It's building. I just pushed code to a shared repo on Bitbucket. <laughs> and my project that I had added actually got built. Yay! So we're, we're, it's busy building now. So I'll quickly go and you see what's happening. Oh, how beautiful. Whoa. Oh, this, <laughs> yo, I'll tell you what this is. It's something you can't avoid. This is kind of your package JSON. It's verbose. The application itself is very simple. That's why no jam. No, no JS doesn't really suck. It's, 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 uh, uh, maybe I can talk about that later at the end. Ask it as a question. Why, why do you think it doesn't suck? Okay. But you already have a book. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, so now to build fast. Ah, here, it's see succeeded. It. It's succeeded. Yeah, I know why I make mistakes. So, I know what the mistake was. So, I have only one test for this project. I do that on purpose because you have probably seen the discussion at uh, TDD, DHH, talking about it. Test-driven development. Uh, no, it has a purpose. Mostly in Fontworks, we're using it as some kind of uh, technical documentation. But I believe uh, tests should also have a meaning. So, in this small little application, I'm using nothing more than one single function that always has to work. The rest is just additional. So there's one test case. This one. 
a test case that is in code, and I will go there. Uh, it's not this repo, it's SD, this one? Yeah. Yes, I'm using Sublime, and it looks like Vim. I can't help it. It's, that's what I do. Uh, I hate this. Toggle menu. Oh, God. I hate the menu bar. Okay, so what did I say again? Um, oh, yeah, the test. So I have one file called tests.js. And this is all it, it, it describes. It describes it literally. So I have something. I describe a module, a unit, or a test case, a scenario. I haven't done it properly here because you normally should be describing scenarios. The user wants to do this. Uh, he goes to the website. Well, that's what your test engine would do then. But here I just to say, say I have generate should respond or it responds with a known code or a known key. And the key gen, that's actually the one that I'm testing here. This, this piece of code here, as you can see already. That's my library. That's the one I wrote. So I want to be sure it does its work. And it does something based on time. So I give it a fixed date. 1981, 1-1. Yeah. Fixed time. Uh, and a fixed key. So I know what the results should be. This is why I'm doing this. I know what the results should be. And I give here what is the expected value. So some people, they write it here as an assert. I can actually write it in a different way. So in another project, I've did write, written it differently. But I'm asserting that they should be equal. So this is kind of like, this is more unit testing. Behavioral is you're expecting certain things, a scenario. And if I do these things, at the end, 1 plus 1 should be equal to. You could expect that would happen in a person buys a shirt. The next day he decides he doesn't want the shirt. That shirt gets returned to the store. So if I had one in the store and I get one returned, that makes two. That's a scenario. So this is what we normally should be doing in behavioral, but this is more unit testing. So this is very important. Um, I go back to my slides, this one. There. So what I did already, I showed my demo. Darn, that was too early. So what you just saw was actually Docker. So you didn't really see it, but in the background, Docker ran. What is Docker? Docker is lightweight virtualization. When I talk about lightweight virtualization, I need to tell you first what the difference is. So this is traditional virtualization. We have hardware. On top of that, we run some host OS and a hypervisor. Hypervisor could be something like VMware. Even KVM is a hypervisor. It's something that manages virtual machines. And the virtual machine actually starts a BIOS process. It will boot up a machine as if it is a real machine. It's very good if you want to run Windows on top of Linux. Perfect solution because that's the only way you can do that. <laughs> or, or you use Wine, but that's not the same. Or maybe even other operating systems. You have to use this. But that means that you're actually here having a whole installation of a guest OS and his bin binaries and libraries just to run an application. <coughs> In the worst case, that could be gigabytes. Yeah. Yeah. If you would have, let's say, um, <coughs> different agents for build process, <coughs> you're running a Java process and you automate the build, you would have maybe virtual machines that run that. All these virtual machines are five or six gigabytes of storage just for the operating system and the libraries with your source code included, might become very big. So this is not a really efficient way, because even the boot up time of that is long. It takes quite a while, so people never turn these machines off. Once the virtual machine started, I'll keep them running. And then, I'll show you what happens later, and that's evil. But. So, Docker is an alternative thing. It uses an operating system level virtualization. It's kind of like comparable if you, you've ever used FreeBSD, Jills, like, or Solaris Zones. It comes close to that, yeah. So Docker uses something in Linux that is, we started to uh, use, it's uh, called Alexi. So the Linux containers. So what it does is it provides process <coughs> isolation. So 
A process that I start in a container cannot break out of the container easily. It's contained in that part. It also doesn't give me the option to allocate resources. I can say how much CPU time or whatever it should have. And check my time. Wow, I don't have that much time. So the difference is this. So all of a sudden we go from this, bang, to that. I cut out the hypervisor and I put something small in between. It's actually the kernel. Functionality inside the kernel. And a small little executable to orchestrate that, to tell something that something should be happening. But I run everything here separately. Each of these silos, actually these, <coughs> are containers. This one shares. You could say one container could be shared for two different applications. But that's generally not what we're doing. We should say every application has its own binaries and libraries. So, back to this. So how do we do that? They use LXC and C groups. And I'll quickly go over that, what they do. LXC provides the operating system level virtualization. It's a method for running multiple isolated Linux systems, and we call these containers, on a single control host. So one machine runs another machine. It sounds like virtual machines, but it's not the same. No. And there's another thing that we're using, it's called the cgroups. So cgroups is a general feature to limit account and also to isolate. To count actually the resource usage. So what can a, a container do or the executable inside? So I can limit it for memory, disk I.O. And anything else that is offered as a parameter. And that's many. Of any process group. So one process could mean that there are several that are dependent on it, that it's kicked off, it started. So this whole group of processes I could limit. I could say, you're not going to get any resources, then just the bare minimum. So they will never overrun your system. So quickly I'll go over what Docker can do then. So Docker, here on my command line, is a single executable here with a lot of options. Hey, cool. Huh? And one of the things I need to get an image. So Docker has a shared repo where they store images. So if you want to have something like, oh, I need to get up very quickly my SQL. Hmm, oh, darn. Pseudo. Yeah, that's another thing. It needs to be run as root. So it will now touch, hopefully, the internet and search for all the containers that have my SQL support in there. People that call this my SQL. If not, we're screwed. I'll go get us some water. <laughs> <laughs> I think I put it here. Yay! My bottle. Oh, and my card. So I don't think that works. But okay, we don't need it. So I could literally pull images from the internet that people have uploaded and say have certain features. So Fedora has a semi-official image there. CentOS is one. It's created by the Docker guys themselves. And I have actually downloaded one from Fedora. So if I do, and that's why I prepared my slides, this is what I would do. I would do Docker pull Fedora. And it says pulling repository. The naming repository is a little bit confusing here, but it's something that I will not go into detail. Yeah? But just notice that if you're ever using it, that name might be confusing at first. And it will download different critical numbers. It says this number, that number, and that number, that number, all completed. And I would have an image that runs Fedora. Cool. So back out. Next one. So I can do, do docker run image name and the command. Oh, let's do that. So I go to my terminal, docker run. I said Fedora, huh? Yeah, Fedora. And which command should I run in Fedora? Bash. No, no, not bash. No, no. First, I want to know if it's really Fedora. Yeah. No, no, no. I'll do this one. The Fedora release, huh? <laughs> oh, permission denied. Yeah, I, I should be running. Uh, that's right. Oh, sorry. Hey! Eisenbach. Yeah, it's 20. That's nothing. That's not special. But okay, I've done that. I've proven it. And I can also see, oh, what is the kernel? 
So what's the kernel you're running? Because that is kind of an interesting one. And I'm running it on GNU Linux. Hey, Rich is dumb and happy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'll compare it with another one. So I have here. I have an example. I did the pool, and then I ran. And look at this. Oh no, I don't have the U name here. Oh yeah, I have the U name here. Look at this. So on my server, I have a server that I need to do for testing. And yes, I, 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 I'm sorry, I use Ubuntu sometimes. <laughs> you need to know, know thy enemy. No. Uh, you need to know that kind of stuff. So, so in the top, sorry, it's a little bit in the top here. It says here, I did in the container on that server, you name. And I got back. It was running on Ubuntu. Uh, but it's Fedora. It shares the kernel. So this is what happens. The always level oh, virtualization, yeah. it shares the kernel. <laughs> Not the binaries and stuff, because that's contained in the container. That's the whole concept. You're reusing resources that are provided. And the first one that you reuse is always the kernel. So, but as you can see, I do the cat here, and I do get Heisenberg. Hey, and I can say, hello world, great. And I can touch a file. Bazinga. Exactly. I'll show you something about that. So I have another command. PSA. PS. Process. So I'll do that here. Maybe you can see all the junk that I've done. Oh. I'll solve that. Wait. Wait. <laughs> so this is this is actually what you see on mine. And hey! I just did it now on my computer. Isn't it correct? I did a cat etc Redora release, and I did you name. Yeah. yeah. But that command, I issued. It's not running anymore. No, it said two minutes ago, and it exited. It yeah. stopped. It shows me what the result after the command was. Actually, I can go back in time and see what is in that container. I'm gonna do that now. So that's not the purpose. But this is on that machine at that moment. So I did, as you saw, I did touch the Zynga. Hey! And I did the Fedora release, yay! And I did the Uname and the Hello World. That's correct. And the last ones I will talk about if I get there, because the time is really short and I should start speeding up. Um, okay, so Docker Div Container ID. In these lists you can see in the front, there's a container ID. So with the container ID, I can identify. Ten minutes, huh? Yeah. <sighs> so uh, with the container ID, I can identify the container that I actually issued with these commands. And what does it show? A diff. A diff between what happened. So I do the one for 21. 21, if you see here, is Bazinga. Uh, that one. The top one. Bazinga. And it shows me here, these are the files that were changed. Dev, dev, uh, ptmx, uh, temp. Oh, and in temp, of course, the bazinga. Hey, of course. That's what I changed. That means that every container, if there is a change, I can see those changes on file system level. I can decide now, this container I don't want anymore. I want to get rid of it. I can go and delete it. So, back to my presentation. Oh, that was my presentation. So this is actually what happens. I have an app. If I run that app, it actually, if it has some output or whatever, it creates a new file system layer. And I can have many different file system layers on top of each other. There's a current limit of 42, I think it was. But they're actually working on removing that. But there's a maximum. But every change is version. So it's kind of like Git or a virtual machine environment. So why is this important? Well, imagine I have this scenario. I install, and bang, it failed. <laughs> Shit! <laughs> Shit, and now what? Uh, oh, 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 LS, and I see, uninstall. Oh, yes, great, bang! <laughs> what? <laughs> I cannot find now what it did. So I might probably what I will be doing, I open VI or Sublime or whatever, and I can go look in the uninstall file. What is that damn thing trying to remove and what does it say filled? <laughs> I wouldn't need to be doing that. So what if I do this? I would say docker run. I do install. And it would fail. <laughs> ah, CBN, <so yeah>, whatever. <laughs> Forget about it. 
about it. I'll try again. I'll try again and do maybe, oh, there was a parameter I forgot. Oh, stupid of me. So Docker run off and A, okay. <laughs> so you would never have a contaminated environment. If you are developing software and your scripts fail and fail to clean up, that virtual machine actually means get rid of it. You are not relying on it anymore. You have to restart from scratch. And with a virtual machine, like on, let's say, VMware or even KVM, reprovision. It needs to make another copy of that one. Ouch, that might take long. You have to reboot it again. Spinning up takes time. It's not very efficient. So Docker provides a much better solution for that because the turnaround time for this is nothing. I don't like the result. I can get rid of it. So what I showed you just now was drone. Drone is actually a build server, easy installation as I said, it just needs one command line. I have an interface, I can link it up to my Bitbucket, my GitHub, lit, uh, GitLab. These are all external services now. It doesn't work with the local repo, but that's the reason for that. We're working on fixing that. And the only thing that I need in my uh, repo is one file. The drone uh, uh, YAML that describes what should I be doing. First of all, it should be running on this image, this Docker image. It runs Node. So I can specify different environments. I can say Node, Python, whatever. And I issue these commands inside. Oh, no time? Okay, I still have five minutes. So in this, I will specify these commands. I should do an, uh, an install of all the packages, and I should run the test. And if it succeeded, I will send a mail to this friendly guy at the end. Even if it fails, I'll send him a friendly mail. But probably I'm not so happy at the end. Because that's me. If it fails, I'm not happy. So I add this to my repo. And if I push it, this is what happens. We saw that. But what if the test fails? I want somebody to work with me on the project. And I write these test cases for a reason. Because I want to be sure that that function works. I want to be sure of that because that's the whole application. So if somebody pushed code and he disregarded this function, I immediately know what went wrong. He probably didn't have the correct time set. Time zone is always an issue. But. So this is why I wanted to fill that. Because what if this production would end up in real, actual production code? It would be pushed out to the internet. I would have hundreds and hundreds of unhappy people that use my application. So. This is what I have, several products. Uh, I have one here for Fakran, on the CD. Uh, actually, the presentation is a project that's built. <laughs> yeah? But then we go to the consistent deployment. So continuous delivery, deployment, difficult subjects. These words sound a lot the same. Well, but they share one thing in common. It's all about CI. That's the most important part. They are about continuous integration. But then you have stages, QA to staging and to production. How do you get your code to these? Automatically, after testing, after it passed these tests and it's green, the code gets pushed, the executables, the binaries, the deliverables, to a separate environment, which is your acceptance environment. Mm -hmm. After that, you run tests. Tests that are different level, maybe tests that describe the user interface more, like scenarios, what our user is doing. These pass. I will go and push that automatically to the acceptance environment of the customer, whoever that might be. And after that, I, I might tell him, you can press, if that one passed, a magic button that says, deploy. This difference, when I have to press a button, deploy, it's called continuous delivery. I have delivered the executables and the product products, the working code, and he needs to press a button. Deployment is different, is when that stage is also automated. So that last step, when that's automated, we call it continuous deployment. So delivery is not deployment. There are eight principles. I will not go over them because I don't have the time. Oh, blah, 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 blah. Yeah, there we go. So I can't, I can't tell you the, the story. But if, if anything fails, it stops the line. This is very important. If anything fails in that whole process, that executable is thrown away. You can't use it. It's done. So 
the only thing, as I said, the deployment is the next step after that, so that's delivery. But how to deploy? So, automate that! Hey! If we can, you also automate that process, and I can do that. As I said earlier, with the hosting of an application or a website, I would like to use PASS, and I can. Because PASS is actually nothing more than a cloud model to deliver a computing platform, which mostly includes an execution environment like a language, a programming language. So you can imagine for PHP, that's just PHP, dependent on how it's integrated, maybe as a module in the Apache environment, maybe if it's a bad host there and they might still have CGI. <laughs> yeah, DreamHost still does that. Well, we'll be offering you two different versions. We have a CGI interface. <laughs> Database, of course, that's also important, but it's difficult. Which database are you using? Redis, or MySQL, or PostgreSQL, or which one? Different options. And we could have a web server, although it's very simple, you still part of the package. So what I'd be using for that is Docker, of uh, Docu. Docu is built on top of Docker also. So there's an image that you deploy into, and it's your runtime. So it's a mini Heroku. Who knows Heroku? It's great, but it's freaking expensive. <laughs> <laughs> it's too expensive, so yeah, I, I love the guys at uh, DocCloud, the guys behind Docker, because they also knew it can be cheaper. That's why they started this whole thing, and they knew hey, we can be hosting Python. And they started this whole Docker thing, and that became Docker.ink. And they're really right about that. But one guy said, well, I'll write something that is really the Heroku, built on top of that. So. It's nothing more than just, um, I have here, uh, oh yeah, this is, I can do it next. So I have my demo repo, that's my application, uh, and in there a proc file. Yeah, 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 I know that. So in my file, a proc file describes which process to start. That's how Heroku works. Four man, you can read about that. It only says at the top, it is a web process. Uh oh, so more there. Web. NPM start. So that means, yeah, yeah, I know. <laughs> Damn, I, I get oh, I have to go quickly. So in my package JSON, I have yes, I know that. I have here. This is the blah blah blah, blah the process, blah, blah blah, all the dependencies that I need. And here, what is start? Start is starting Node. Node server JS. So I can look. What does Node JS? Uh, uh, Node uh, server JS do? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is all. There it is. It starts express. It's nothing much, but since I'll be using this for improvements on my code, I will be adding mocks of how Dropbox works. Because I will add some functionality to my application, so I need to mock these kind of things. So I need a backend eventually. So, but I want to have that on my environment. And so I'll make a small change and I'll add something. So. Uh, let me see. Uh, in the index, yeah. I'll do here for FUTCON. So, and I need to change another file because that's a cache manifesto. If you're doing web development, you will know this. Yay. Application cache, great. Okay, so I did that. So I have my git status. Uh, you can see I have these two changes. Git add, git commit, Burp. sorry, I'm not more creational now. So that's my change, and I want to push this, I want to deploy this. Okay, so I have a git remote. I have a git remote here, uh, I have tried to see even with Heroku, and I was, <gasps> pricing model, wow. <laughs> Ooh, Docker. <laughs> What is Docker? It's just a Git repo I push to. So you can see in my, I'll go there this way. Yes, I know it can be different, but I'm just lazy. Yeah. Docker, as you can see, just all these other things, just like Heroku, Docker is just a path. The URL. As user Docker, I will push to my own server and I will deploy it. So I'll show you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, it was already. Git push. No, git push, docker master, master, 
magic happens. I have changes. <gasps> Voila! Whoa. I'm pushing code into my repo, and it finds Node.js app. And it will start to, oh, that's a version. I will install all your Node modules. And there you saw, there are quite a lot just for Express. But hey, poof, deploy. Deploy. <laughs> so I can go to my web browser, and I can be very happy because I have my application running. So G off apps, uh, not this one. That one, I will not be cheating you. And there I should see the name. Oh, it doesn't show. That's probably because of the cache manifesto. I'm sorry, but it's least this is the application as it would be deployed. Yay! I'm happy. So, what did I do for that? Almost nothing. I got my code deployed and I just needed to describe what I want. I didn't go to a server and say, install Node.js, at get or whatever. I just said, I want a container that contains Node. And the backend did all that. So, as you see, I described in the package JSON on the engine. I say here, FG to be Node.js. That's for the, that it finds out what it is. Run that command. And I described that. It should do that. Really? Okay, good. I just add the remote. I push my code. And I would then be able, it would be running. It's just deployed. And then I would be running. And I do a Docker PS. I would see it did a build. Build step. And it runs a command to start that process. Point it to a certain IP address, an endpoint. So that's actually my whole continuous deployment in a way. But I've done it in a continuous delivery. I have done pushing the buttons. I haven't done it automated. But I can actually do that. Because at the end of my drone script, I can say deploy. What's the target? Well, git. Push my app to that server, that location. And as soon as the build passes, my application is magically deployed. And here, voila, bang, at the end, it will say, here, this is, after the success of the projects and the tests, my application will be deployed. This is continuous deployment. So if everything passed, you automatically have a production environment. Of course, there are different projects of customers that deal differently with this. They would still say, well, we'll do not do the whole production environment. Just five out of ten machines. And we will see how people will use it. And deciding on that, we will switch over all or not. But this is a, a, a thing that people will, companies can decide for themselves. So how does this work? Software development uh, deployment using Git, where code is pushed to the repo, hooks, will perform actions on in this case, sh command. It will intercept the sh command. Instead of what normally would happen if you do it on your local machine, you could do it with post update. So, but don't you? It's only a hundred lines of bash code. So, I can actually show you. So this is the receive, this is the build, that's the release, that's the deploy, that's the cleanup, and that was it. So, and it runs nginx. So every build step after it deploys the app, it will write this file. This file is nothing more than proxying the web request. So eventually what we can do, you don't deliver applications. In the end, you don't need to deliver an application. The container is the delivery unit. So this would solve a lot of problems because if you hand over a binary, people would start to ask you how to install it. If you hand over a container, they just need to import that in your environment. Bang! Magically, everything works out of the box. So this is what we're going to go to. So, there are different projects out there. Doku, as I said, Big does deployment, Flynn does deployment and orchestration, DICE, Shipyard. CoreOS actually is a very good project to keep watching. It uses systemd and Docker and recently got integration with DICE, so that whole chain is all connected. All done. Jenkins has a Docker plugin for the agents, and Red Hat is working on OpenShift Gear D. Docker containers deployed from the OpenShift environment. But I have still problems. What you saw, I actually staged in a way because I didn't do accept, uh, acceptance tests. Yeah, but that's a small detail. 
And I didn't use unified containers, so my deploy and my builds were not the same container. But I can still rely on them because the differences between them are minimal. Yeah? So this is my presentation. Are there any questions? And I promise you a book, huh? I promise you a book, but was it you or? Oh yeah, you? So please. I have still three books. Ask me a question. And you really have to hurry. <laughs> I overran my time. Pass a tea break. It's a tea break, yeah. yeah. Sure. So, so why use that? So, why choose that Doka? So, for example, the it's Amazon. a password. No, 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 everybody does it. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, I mean that. So, so background was a background. Uh, uh, okay, now I will we'll talk about that. My my slide said. I, Fragrant for me is nothing more than just a management tool around VirtualBox or uh, VMware or whatever. <laughs> but you're using a full virtual machine. I don't need this overhead. If okay. I'm only doing Microsoft.NET development, I might consider that. <laughs> I would rather be doing it on Mono, but if I have to, I don't want that. I will rather run it in a container because then if something goes wrong, bang, I remove the container. This is something you can't easily do. You can have a snapshot, of course. Oh, yeah. But a snapshot for me still feels more like overhead, unnecessary, because every step I do is already a near different step, a different layer. So every line of thing that I typed, I tried it this way, no. I tried it this way, no. Did I this way, no. Okay, in the end, I'll get rid of all of them. It's, it's more for me lightweight. It's much quicker turnaround time. And if I think it's good, I can persist it. How do you think about the so, uh, background LXC? So, X. And what do I think about background? Well, background, so, back, back, uh, back, background can back, uh, the back end. Uh, I'm not really following. What I think of fragment, I can say, I think it's a great tool. Okay. So I don't like VirtualBox in a oh, way, okay. so that's yeah. unfortunate. I know. So, yeah. yeah. I like KVM more in that regard, but sure. Thanks. <laughs> yeah. Any other questions, please? Uh, in the morning, uh, Lena shared something about uh, System D with us. Mm -hmm. And uh, he thought uh, System D will get uh, more requirement from uh, for, for uh, container and uh, mm -hmm. sandbox. And uh, System D has a container named uh, System D S1. S1, yes. Yeah. Uh, do, you, do you think uh, uh, Docker will? Need to compete with. Uh, I, I won't call it comp I don't call it competition. I call it choice. Uh, and spawn. Uh, actually, if you look at the history, even Microsoft. Uh, uh, not Microsoft. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I mean Red Hat. Sorry. <laughs> the Red Hat on OpenShift. OpenShift is based on SE Linux containers. It's also a way to isolate your processes. So. Is that competing with Docker? Well, in a way it does, but it also lives aside. It has a different use case. When applications are in a user desktop environment, they have different needs. I can, of course, run the same app if I want in a Docker environment, and I can isolate them. But it will probably not be, for me, a very useful experience, because every time I would start Firefox, I would have a new container, and all the changes between them are differently persisted, and my bookmarks magically gone. So Nspawn is more about the idea of this is for a user environment because they do need to write bookmark files away and after I start the application again I want those same bookmarks to be there. So it's not competing. Uh, and uh, LXC is quite all the things. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> I would call it production proven. Not <laughs> <laughs> uh, Does any time do uh, will the Docker uh, switch the backend from LXC to System D and Spawn? No, 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 no. Okay, no, no, no. <coughs> no, it's, it's, it's a different thing. Um, Docker is for management of LXC containers. Yes. System D is <laughs> foremost a process management system, services management. Yes. They're actually working, and that's what you see. And I said here. Um, references, was it here at the end? Ah, here. So, this one, CoreOS. CoreOS is combining System D and Docker. Yes. They're using System D 
to trigger and start containers. But they're Docker containers. So they're just leveraging services management from System D. I do not see them easily saying, oh, we'll start and change over to end spawn because we want to be running user applications in that environment. The use case is different. So, no, I don't see them easily switch. And why would they? I think LXC now provides good functionality. The only problem they once had was the file system. Well, we changed that. It's now VM, so no big deal there. I don't see any change. And Docker system, this cannot run in the Docker. I can actually, if you want. Yes. Yeah. If it already worked, you can new, search. New versions yeah. from system from D203? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's possible. Oh, yes. For a long time, people actually ran docker run and then image name and then a command, bin bash. But you're actually not starting a real environment. You're just running that single application. Uh, for, some, for some environments, you actually need this init process. So you need systemd or you need an init process. So a lot of people have worked around it, provided workarounds to get that same behavior, that when you start the container, you actually run a whole stack of different applications that run, rely on each other. So this was essential, so this is in there now. You can run system. Thank you. Thank okay. you for okay. okay. Any other? No? No? No question? I'll take it home then. So, so, uh, uh, you I already have. have. Yeah, but yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I don't need one book. Yes. Okay. Uh, 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 I, I will answer. Okay. So I saw you uh, run some Docker commands, and mm -hmm. the different Docker commands spawns different containers. Yeah. So 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 every command I typed in Docker will spawn a different container. Yes and no. If there's output for sure, there will be a different con uh, container, and it so, will take this space. But it's it's the idea that they layer on top of each other. And if you think that the changes are worth persisting, worth saving, it becomes a commit. So, so, so you can commit yeah. a container into yeah. a Docker image. And it becomes that image, yeah. Oh, so okay. if you would have, for instance, you have Fedora, and you would yeah. say, this is old Fedora, let's yum update it. Yeah. Yeah. That would make a lot of changes in yeah. that single image. And then you can say, that becomes my new image. Commit it, you create a new image. Okay. And that could be the base of all your other images. So this is the reason why we do that. We, we say what your base is, where you start your process. I haven't gone into a lot of detail of that, but something you can ask me offline. So, last book, please. I also got to point at a person. Uh, 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 if I have a survey, yes. Uh, Docker is a kernel, we, uh, which for applications we share on the host kernel, right? Yeah. But if I want to share out the uh, application, maybe a legacy application, which depends on libraries for all well, okay. the <coughs> what will happen. Okay, so that's the point. When you talked about legacy applications that rely on... Uh, old kernel. All, oh, yeah, but that's a different thing, an old kernel. There you would have a problem. Because then, in that case, you would actually probably have to run a virtual machine. But why would you need an old kernel? Mostly, the kernel stays compatible. They add functionality on, and they would not break it. This is a general rule. There are situations they had to do it. But in general, kernels should be stable and always be backwards compatible or forward. Just to comment on old kernel, yeah. if you have a building against an embedded machine which is running an old kernel, then maybe you need to ensure that your application is running on the old kernel, which yeah. doesn't have the new features. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we did a very, very old project, but still have used uh, using it, but no development, but we have to maintain it. <laughs> yeah, so, so this is what I meant, this is the difference, because it actually is still in the same way as, as a virtual machine. If you would run the virtual machine, you would have the same old kernel, the binaries it depends on, the li libraries, and the app. In Docker, that doesn't change that much, because in that case, you would still have that, the dependency between those. And I think I missed an image here. I made another image. But okay, so you would have the libraries it depends on, the old glibc or whatever, is in that container. So the only thing that could differentiate is the kernel. But in general, that should never pose a problem. But as Martin said, in an embedded environment, probably that will be a serious issue because they all run on old versions 2, 2 point something. I don't think you could ever even upgrade those. <laughs>
because those drivers are hard to get. <laughs> so, yeah? but that's a different problem, not for you. Yeah? Okay, I have one book and I just, I have a number on my mind. Number seven, who says it? Who's, who says number seven? Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, I have a uh, I want to know how a uh, docker to manage the uh, storage. How, ma uh, how docker store manages the storage? I, there is a folder where you can see where it has all these uh, uh, differences between the files. It is all stored on a Fedora or CentOS system and it's a separate file that's layered. In the older implementations they used AUFS that took care of that. But you can see all of these changes, you can just go to the file system. Yeah, yeah, just I think everything I put in the uh, Docker, every chain, I just commit it like a GitHub commit. Mm -hmm. So uh, it will it will change a new commit. So uh, I want to know how Doc to manage this commit. Uh, Docker is smart. Oh shit! I <laughs> yes, I, I don't trust myself. That's why. <laughs> I'm a developer. I drink. I need coffee. I need to drink coffee. So no. What I will show you first of all is it talks here about a virtual size. So every image itself already has a virtual size, and everything I build on top of that becomes a separate image, yeah, and it gets layered on top. How much it stores is the change itself. So. Only the changes so the your... The thing you always keep the original thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It will always be the same. It's, it's kind of like you do a git. Git add a file. And then you do a, uh, a commit. And then you do a change. Do that same file. Git add commit. Git only stores the changes. Oh, yeah. So the, the overhead is minimal, but it allows me to say, hey, oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> it allows me to go back in time and say, oh, I don't want this Docker us to the I want to remove that image. And I can say, this is what I did. It's completely stupid. Oh, I want to go and remove that. Yeah, yeah I, think, I think something got removed just now by copy pasting. Oh, filter remove. Oh, probably something in use. Oh, no such image. Oh. Even better. I don't know why. There's something missing in our machine. But you can remove these images then. You can remove the change that's there. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's not a good. Oh, sorry. See, RN. I should drink coffee. Why a tea break? See, RN. <laughs> <laughs> not RM. Not RM image. Okay, sorry. See, okay. any coffee. So you can remove that. So now if I go look there, that change is gone. Oh. So, and I can do the same to that one. Hey, I don't need to do that because these changes are minimal. But now I'm pretty sure that if I would do something, it's clean. I have no leftovers. I only have the base image. So this is why you do that. Yeah? So I want to stop here. I'll give you the last book. Okay. Any other questions? No? Okay, good. Now get it out. Okay? Yeah? Okay, thank you. Thank you for your time. If you have any questions, any question else, please send me an email. I'm willing to talk to you. Yeah? Okay? You can talk to me in the venue, but I'm willing to answer anything you ask me. Okay? Thanks a lot. Okay. Okay.